This is part B of the weather lecture. Another important factor that influences weather is the interaction of land and water. So because land and water have different specific heat capacities, that means they warm up at different rates. So land that's near water often has that often means there's a temperature difference between the land and the adjacent water. This is especially important in coastal re locations or in regions near lakes. Uh, and in those places, you can experience weather conditions that are influenced by water being a different temperature than the land. And a classic example of this that we experience in Flora, Florida is the sea breezes. If you've ever lived in coastal Florida, you know what this is, but it's also important for, for central Florida, uh, where we're located here. And um, this happens when the land warms up during the day and the water is cooler than the land. So when the land warms up, that hot air rises. When the hot air rises, that creates low pressure and basically a pressure difference between the ocean and the land and that moist air moves in from the ocean towards the land. That creates a breeze. That's the sea breeze that you feel. Um, but as that uh, cool moist air moves in and gets heated up and it rises, uh, that creates clouds. Those clouds, um, cause precipitation and afternoon thunderstorms. That basically is a cycle uh, that gets set up and that's what causes afternoon thunderstorms for us here in central Florida during the summer is this sea breeze effect. In coastal areas that sea breeze feels good because that's a little bit cooler air moving in from the ocean in the afternoon. Here in Gainesville, in the middle of the peninsula, we don't feel so much of that nice, cool sea breeze, but we certainly experience the effect of that air convecting upward and forming thunderstorms in the afternoon. So that's what sets up that sort of reliable afternoon thunderstorms that we experience in the summer here. So this is a picture that I took of my kids flying a, a kite at the beach one day. <clears throat> and this is a classic afternoon sea breeze situation. So I was standing with my back to the ocean when I took this picture. My kids are, are flying a kite in that nice strong sea breeze moving in from the ocean. Um, but you can see as we look inland that um, warm land is causing the moist air to rise and form those thunder clouds uh, more inland and probably driving home we're probably going to be driving through some thunderstorms so that's a classic afternoon sea breeze effect going on there another example of that interaction of land with water uh, happens in the winter uh, and that's lake effect snow. So lake effect snow happens when very cold uh, air moves over warmer lake water and moisture gets picked up. Um, as that really cold air moves over the lake, moisture comes up from the warmer lake um, air and that moves over land and results in dumping of huge amounts of snow on the land uh, because that cold air has picked up that moist um, air over the lake, dumps it onto the land. This is an example of a big lake effect snow. These are the Great Lakes right here. And cold continental air from Canada has moved over the Great Lakes, picked up moisture from those Great Lakes and is dumping it on the regions east of the Great Lakes. So this is a big lake effect here. 
you know, Buffalo, New York is famous for its lake effect snows. And it, you can get a lot of snow dumped on these regions because of those uh, lake effects. Another example of weather, and in this case, actually climate effects being caused by the interaction of land masses with water is the Mediterranean climate pattern. So a Mediterranean climate is characterized by relatively mild but dry summers with um, the bulk of the precipitation happening sort of spread out over a, a mild winter. And the regions on Earth where that happens is, is outlined in yellow on this map. And it's typically located along the western coast, coasts of land masses uh, where they meet, meet the ocean. Again, characterized by dry summers and relatively wet um, but mild winters. These places um, are often pleasant places to be. So, you know, the, the Mediterranean uh, zone is a classic place to go vacationing. Uh, the Pacific Northwest in the U.S., um, Central to Southern Chile and South America are, are pleasant places to be. They're good places to grow grapes. So a lot of some of the best wine growing regions in the world exist in Mediterranean climates. But those are there because of uh, interactions of uh, ocean currents with land masses. Topography has a really important effect on weather. And we often see these topographic effects in vegetation in areas where elevation changes a lot, for instance. A lot of these topographic effects are due to the effects of elevation on temperature. Um, the effect of elevation on temperature is called orographic or topographic cooling. So when you move up in elevation, air gets cooled. So as you move up, the air gets cooling. This is defined by the adiabatic lapse rate. Lapse, L-A-P-S-E, rate. And that's just the rate that air cools as it rises. And this is about 9.8 degrees C per thousand meters in elevation, or 5.4 degrees C per um, 1,000 feet in elevation change for those of us in the United States. So as air rises, it gets cooler. Cool air holds, can hold less moisture than warmer air. So what that means is that as air masses move up the windward sides of mountains and cool, precipitation happens. So as you go up in elevation on the windward side of mountains, you tend to get an increase in the amount of precipitation as you go up in elevation. As those air masses reach, for instance, the tops of mountains and move down the other side, they're basically depleted in moisture. So as those air masses move down the leeward sides of mountains, those masses of air are drier and there's a rain shadow. It's drier on the leeward sides of mountains. And we see this effect of topography when we look at vegetation. This is a, a map of basically vegetation biomass in the continental United States. And we can really clearly, especially in the Western United States, see the effects of topography on precipitation. So, you know, there's some mountain ranges here out west 
um, from northern Washington down into northern California, there's the Coast Range. And then in, inland from that, there's the Cascade Range and then the Sierra Range of mountains. Um, and what happens is as that moist air moves in from the Pacific and goes up the coast ranges, it dumps a lot of precipitation. So there are areas in the coast range, actually they're the Olympic mountains in Washington. There are some areas in the Olympics in Washington that receive, you know, many, many feet of rain every year, like 20 feet of rain. Um, and on the eastern side of those mountains, it's drier. And you can see very strong effects uh, of that change in precipitation on vegetation biomass. So for instance, the leeward side of these mountains right here is a huge desert. This is the Great Basin. And this is desert because it's so dry on the leeward side of those mountains. And the only places that we see forests in this part is um, on the windward sides of, for instance, the Rocky Mountains. So air gets lifted up a little bit on the leeward, I'm sorry, the windward side of the Rocky Mountains, drops a little bit more precipitation, squeezes a little bit more precipitation out of those air masses, and you see some additional forests at high elevations in the Rockies. So that's why we have forest at higher elevation in the Rockies is because on the windward side, a little bit additional rain gets squeezed out. Now we also have uh, those um, precipitation effects in the eastern United States, uh, but the mountains are not as, as tall, uh, so the effects are not as strong on precipitation in the eastern United States as in the western United States. But you still see, for instance, heavier bi uh, forest biomass at higher elevations due to that effect in the east. Another effect of topography on weather has to do with uh, the creation of topographic winds. Sometimes these um, topographic winds are referred to as FUN, F-O-E-H-N winds. Topographic winds are, are sort of similar to the rain shadow effect that we talked about before, where as these air masses move up over mountains and dump all their water on the windward side, when they come down the leeward side, they're dry. As they come down, they get pressurized and heat up and also speed up, so gravity acts on air too. So sometimes these air masses moving down the leeward sides of mountains can move really fast. And that hot, dry, fast moving topographic wind can sometimes be very destructive. Um, in the Rocky Mountains and Sierra Mountains in the West, sometimes these topographic winds are called Chinook winds and they have other names in other parts of the world that fun wind i imagine is a german term some places they call them like diablo winds devil winds and that's because they can be destructive those hot dry winds can really contribute to for instance the development and movement of forest fires uh, so those topographic winds can have big effects sometimes you know they're localized and they're really important in mountainous areas, but uh, they can be uh, really important in some of those locations. Another important weather phenomenon is sometimes called ENSO. ENSO stands for El Nino Southern Oscillation. And, and the, the essence of ENSO is that um, changes in water temp temperature 
in the Eastern Pacific. can influence weather patterns in the tropics, the subtropics, especially, but also and beyond. So this diagram sort of shows what would be the, the normal or neutral conditions in the Pacific Ocean? So here's North America, South America. This is Australia over here, I believe. Um, so this is the Pacific Ocean. And this is sort of normal conditions. There's um, sort of coolish water in the Eastern Pacific and warm water out in the middle of the Pacific. But periodically, and this is um, every few years, we uh, a situation uh, called El Nino develops. So El Nino is, El Nino is just Spanish for um, the male, a male baby. And when Nino is capitalized, the male baby refers to Jesus. And that's because this warming that happens in the Eastern Pacific. You see this warm water is, is developing more towards the Eastern Pacific. That often happens or develops around Christmas time. So these warm waters start developing around Christmas time in, in the Eastern Pacific. And that's called um, El Nino. That tends to, to um, shift, whoops, let's get the pen tends to shift the jet stream further south. And that can cause all sorts of changes in temperature and thunderstorm activity east of there, both in the southern United States and in the subtropics, but also further north in North America. I'm not going to generalize about the weather effects because I, I see there's, there's lots of potential weather effects listed for El Nino, but just know that this influences weather conditions. And um, those El Nino cycles can last for months to up to a year, and they tend to alternate with La Nina. So La Nina is just means the girl child. I think it's meant as a sort of yin and yang to El Nino happens when the water in the Eastern Pacific becomes much cooler than usual. And that results in a more wavy Gulf stream and tends to move, I'm sorry, move the jet stream further north. And that can, for instance, result in more severe weather activity in the southeastern United States. Those intervening periods, those neutral or normal periods, sort of happen in between these El Nino, La Nina conditions. And together, that, ref that uh, is called the El Nino Southern Oscillation, where that Southern Oscillation refers to associated changes in the jet stream and atmospheric patterns. This whole ENSO cycle is, like I said, quite complicated, and there's whole fields of study, you know, revolving around ENSO cycles. This graph shows, you know, oscillating periods between sort of, um, you know, periods of normal conditions to El Nino weather conditions alternating with La Nina weather conditions over long periods of time. So you can see it's not completely predictable. There may be periods where you have, you know, sort of multiple El Ninos without inter intervening La Nina periods. But uh, those are cycles that occur over time. No lecture on weather would be complete without talking about extreme weather. So uh, I'm from 
the central United States, where, uh, which used to be called Tornado Alley, you know, Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas. Um, in reality, Tornado Alley has moved east with changing climate. But at any rate, tornadoes uh, tend to form in supercells, where supercells are basically large, extreme thunderstorms. So especially in the, in the spring, um, these very large thunderstorm, thunderstorms can form and they develop sort of persistent circulation or cyclonic patterns where they rotate. And that rotation can lead to the development of, oh, there's a tornado dropping down out of the bottom of this supercell. As you know, tornadoes can be really destructive and they're very localized and pretty small for a weather event, but they can be uh, extremely destructive and have uh, winds and excess in excess of several hundred miles per hour. Another extreme weather event are hurricanes. Uh, here in Florida, we're familiar with hurricanes. Hurricanes are basically a type of tropical cyclone that occurs in the Atlantic Ocean. Pacific tropical cyclones are called typhoons. So, so typhoons are just hurricanes that form in the Pacific. Uh, they tend to develop in areas of low pressure and they can be very destruct destructive. So this is a famous uh, photograph taken in the aftermath of Hurricane Michael, which caused a huge path of destruction uh, in northern Florida and south Georgia, destroyed a, you know, about a billion dollars worth of timber. Uh, so hurricanes have very high winds and are long lasting. They can last over days or weeks and cover a huge land area. So hurricanes are among the most destructive of weather phenomena. Hurricanes uh, tend to develop, develop starting in Africa. These low pressure systems develop and sort of peel off the coast of Africa and move across the Atlantic. And if temperatures in the Atlantic are sufficient, basically these low pressure systems can develop into tropical storms and then develop into hurricanes. So this shows the development of Hurricane Irma, uh, which developed into a tropical storm and then a hurricane and then moved uh, into the Caribbean and up into Florida. And that's a very typical pattern for hurricanes. We just see them peeling off the coast of Africa, moving across the Atlantic, and then in, into the uh, Caribbean and sometimes into the southeastern United States. You know, Gulf coastal regions are, you know, really prone to hurricanes. This is a neat site that Noah put up where you can put in uh, a city, for instance, and see the historic landfalls of hurricanes. Here I put in Pensacola, and these are all the historic hurricanes that moved into Pensacola. So Gulf coastal regions are just uh, get hammered by hurricanes. <laughs>